All right. All right. Greetings and welcome to this program. I am Vishaka Desai, Chair of the Committee on Global Thought and the Project Leader for Politics of Visual Arts in a Changing World, an initiative of the Committee on Global Thought, which in itself is a presidential initiative at Columbia University. I am delighted that all of you have joined us and it is this particular program, uh, Contested Legacies, Public Monuments uh, in Global Perspective, is part of a multi-year project entitled Politics of Visual Arts. And that in itself is supported by a generous uh, grant from Andy Warhol Foundation. So I want to acknowledge that support. And I also want to acknowledge our partners, outreach partners who have really helped us uh, spread the word from all over Columbia, number of different institutions, which are already have been um, on our poster. Uh, let me just say that when we think about the issues of public monuments, right now it's very much in the public arena and in the public eye. Whether we start with the US, when we deal with the Roosevelt sculpture, um, as we have seen at the Museum of Natural History, or we think about the removal of the Confederate statues in the Southern United States. It is also true that in the UK and South Africa, roads must fall, a major movement to destroy and remove the sculpture of steel roads um, has been part of our public consciousness. And there are also other kinds of monument destructions that have been part of our life 
for more than two decades. And I just want to remind us that all over the world, this idea of destruction has been part and parcel of our psyche for almost 20 years or more. So if you look at the destruction of the Babri Masjid, of course, right there, as you see it, um, the previous sculpture was a removal of Gandhi in Ghana, uh, the sculpture itself, um, or the destruction of Babri Masjid, the 16th century monument in India that is supposed to be on the birthplace on the ground where the Hindu god Rama was supposed to be born. Um, then we also have the destruction of the uh, world heritage sites, Palmyra in um, Syria that created a huge outrage all over the world. And of course, I always think about the destruction of the Buddhas, uh, the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan by Taliban. Each one of these really remind us that there is something around the power of destruction and power of these images that are more than just what they look like at the beginning. Historians would remind us that the destruction of monuments and readaptation or reconstruction of monuments for new purposes has been as old as the creation of monuments that serve political or power purposes. Um, so once I make that statement, it sounds like, is there nothing new? Is it all the same? And in order for us to understand our moment, it's important to ask that question. What is unique about this moment? How do we understand the political dynamics of the current moment? How do we distinguish between destruction of monuments and sculptures for specific religious or political purposes versus destruction that attempts to right a political wrong? What is the role of history and memory in both the destructive acts and in the original intent of the monuments? How can we make right the historical wrongs and where do we go from here? I often think about, when we think about this, what is it in this monuments that creates such a statement of power and anger and anguish? Um, as the mayor of, former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landro said, after the movement of the removal of Confederate statues in Charleston came about, or New Orleans came about, and he says that these statues are not just stone, and metal. They're not just innocent remembrances of a benign history. These monuments purposefully celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, and the terror that it actually stood for. In order for us to explore these questions more deeply, more thoroughly, and understand it in a uh, more relational cross-cultural context. I'm delighted that we have wonderful group of scholars, activists, and leaders, thought leaders, who can help us delve, go deeper into these questions. So before I introduce them, let me just quickly tell you about the logistics of the program. And that is that each one of our four panelists would make short presentations. And then we will have comments by our two discussants. And then during this program, I'm hoping that you will make use of chat function and write your comments. I will pay attention to that. And I hope that we will have time for the last 15, 20 minutes to actually also hear from you because I want this to be as much as possible a conversation and also to hear from all of you. So let me introduce our speakers and I'm gonna introduce all four of them and um, in the order that they're gonna speak. So the first speaker is Zeynep Chalik. And as Professor Chalik is a distinguished professor emerita at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, an author and a scholar a curator who has actually been steeped in this idea of uh, reception and perception, as well as intention of things, cultural things. Uh, she's author of many books, but the two that I thought 
would be really of interest to all of you is one is remaking of Istanbul and displaying the Orient. And that actually she was a co-editor for, and she is working on a new book and I can't wait to read it, which is Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Shahid Wawda. And let's see if we can have Shahid's face, Andrew. See where he is. And Shahid, there you go, is the uh, currently the R.G. Mafaji Chair in Critical Humanities and the Director of the School of African and Gender Studies, Anthropology and Linguistics, it's a mouthful, at the University of Cape Town. But again, Shahid is not only a professor, a scholar, a critical thinker, and an activist who has even worked not just in not-for-profit world, but in the trade union, and his scholarship encompasses history of trade union movement all the way to the idea of colonial and um, colonial heritage, cultural heritage, and modernity. And so he will give us a perspective from South Africa and from the African continent in terms of where these issues are. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Professor Colin Wayne Leach, my colleague right here at Columbia and now at Barnard. Um, he is a professor at Barnard and is a social and personality psychologist. Um, his work is particularly around the intersection of psychology, politics, as well as understanding emotions in a social cultural context so that he is the co-editor of Psychology as Politics, Immigrant Life in the US and the Social Life of Emotions. And he will focus particularly on the American context and, and especially the Confederacy and other um, sculptures. And our final speaker is Marie-Louise Jansen. And Marie-Louise Jansen directs a very special project that's a global project. And it's a contested histories in public spaces project organized in cooperation with All Souls College at the University of Oxford. She previously worked at the Salzburg Global Seminar. And in fact, I met her at Global uh, Seminar along with Shahid. So some of us are colleagues in different contexts, um, which is really terrific. And uh, she is now both uh, the director of this particular project in the development, and it was founded at the Southwood Global Seminar. So she will talk about the larger transnational perspective because that's what that project is. So without further ado, may I ask Professor Chalet to start the first presentation. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here with my esteemed colleagues. Controversies over statues have a long history throughout the world. What to do with historically charged memorials is not a settled matter. They have been dealt with in various ways under different circumstances. The trajectories of French colonial statues in North Africa, open windows to the past in the present. Algeria, invaded by Statumania from the 1840s on, that is just after 10 years um, following the French occupation, has a turbulent history of colonial statues, paralleling the turbulent history of the French occupation. I hope to contribute to current discussions briefly uh, by briefly surveying three strategies that dealt with colonial statues in the aftermath of Algeria's independence in 1962. Erasure, substitution, and manipulation. Can I have the slides, please, Andrew? Okay, the first is erasure. The statue of the Duke of Orléans, Ferdinand Philippe, was erected in Algiers in 1845 um, in an art form totally foreign to local norms and entirely disrespectful of them. It was the first of its kind 
the imposing five meters high exterior statue occupied a prominent place in the newly opened Place Darm adjacent to a major mosque. You can all see the slide on the right left. Our images are overlapping it on my screen. I marked it on the air view uh, that is from the 1930s. Um, that major mosque is called the Mosque al Jadid and it dates from the 17th century. The proximity and the relationship between the statue and the mosque conveyed a powerful message about the colonial presence in Algeria. Contradicting the urban design principles of the sighting of statues, the Duke statue was strategically situated, not in the center of the plaza, but to the side, immediately in front of the mosque, thus entangling the two monuments in a dialogue while stating clearly who was leading who. The mosque was made to look at the back of the Duke and the derriere of the horse in an unmistakable message. The Duke's head slightly turned, fixed his gaze on the Kasbah on the hill and underlined symbolically the French control over the Algerian people. Next, please. Next slide. Not surprisingly, the spontaneous burst of public celebrations following Algeria's independence targeted the Duke's statue right away. It first acquired an Algerian flag and soon it was taken down. It was not destroyed, next please. But after a year's wait on a beach on the right, it was shipped to France together with other statues. I am not going to get into the history of repatriated statues in France. This is very long, but we don't have the time for it today. A modest abstract fountain was built on the spot it occupied, turning the Al Jadid Mosque into the unique monument of the plaza. And yet, the memory of the colonial statue lives in the city's vernacular. More than half a century after independence, many residents of Algiers refer to the square as the square of the horse. What remains of the statue in collective memory is not the Duke, but his horse for reasons that may have only tangential links to the original intentions but are also detached from the official naming of the public space as Place de Martyr, Square of the Martyrs, in acknowledgement of victims of the decolonization war. I was told that this was too painful to repeat in everyday language. Next. Substitution served as a straightforward translation. A French hero was replaced with a local hero of comparable stature, declaring victory over the colonizer. Maréchal Thomas Bujot's statue at the center of the new European town on the left on the image, dated from 1852. Like the Duke's, his gaze was turned toward the old city. The Duke and the Maréchal hence complemented each other in locking the French surveillance over uh, the colonized population from two perspectives. Next. Maréchal Bougeot was originally sent from France to pacify Algeria in 1836 and had confronted the forces of, legendary, of the legendary Algerian Emir Abdelkader. Who could be a better substitute for Maréchal Bujot than Emir Abdelkader? Abdelkader replaced him in full glory on the right. Next. Next, please. Okay, good. The third approach I will discuss is manipulation. Manipulation involves camouflaging the colonial statue in its entirety, but otherwise allowing it to stand. The results are striking as observed in the Monument au Mort, 
erected to the memory of those who died in World War I. I. Located on the main axis of the French city, it had a complicated program. In addition to the names of more than 10,000 soldiers, Europeans and Algerian Muslims, it included war scenes on the lower level. On the pedestal, mounted soldiers carried a dead body with France represented by a figure of Marianne at the center. Perhaps because of its imagery that featured ordinary military men and locals, it survived the fate of other French monuments and was not taken down in 1962. In 1978, however, on the eve of the third African game, the mayor of Algiers commissioned artist Mohamed Isiakan to cover the statue, couvre moi ça, he says, because the statue could be seen as an embarrassing remnant of the colonial past. Next, please. Isiakam disappeared the monument by encasing it in cement while preserving it within a wood frame behind the concrete. The structure was turned into an abstract work of art, but the artist appropriated it into the Algerian revolution and repoliticized it by sculpting two hands, breaking a chain on the front facade. This intervention, referred to sarcastically as betonman, is open to many interpretations. Is it a celebration of Algerian independence or is it a constant reminder of its colonial history? Does the roughness allude to the violence of the colonial rule and the violence of the decolonization war? Is colonialism buried alive here? Certainly, the idiosyncratic structure does not leave the casual passerby unmoved, but prompts multiple reactions and has a shocking impact. To conclude, the case studies presented in this paper attest to the resilience of colonial era structures. One way or other, they are survivors. They are survivors. Even when they're completely erased, they are survivors. Their survival, I would argue, reveals their ability to shift the meanings that they carry. Thank you. So Shahid, you're next. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, well, it's afternoon here in South Africa. I'm sure it's still morning in the, in the United States. Uh, and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very glad to be here and very privileged. Uh, I, if, if I could have the, the, the slides up, please. Okay. So before I begin the actual talk, uh, I just want to acknowledge that this research work is being conducted with colleagues of mine, June Bam Hutchinson, Dudun Lovu, and Kershen Pasham, uh, all from the Center for African Studies at the University of Cape Town. Um, I'm going to pose this question. Is it possible to recognize, address, and resolve injustices in and through cultural heritage? And I'm going to address this question through the context of the statue of Cecil John Rhodes. The next slide, please. So this is the brooding gaze of Rhodes before it was removed under pressure from students and the staff in March, 2015. The gaze is over disputed land, but also northwards as if Rhodes vision of the British empire stretching from Cape Town to Cairo is still intact. Next slide, please. Here, I just want to say it's quite astounding if you think of Europe in the background of, the, of, of roads. When one thinks of it, the size of Europe in relation to Africa, almost a peninsula uh, jutting into uh, the North African coast. 
The next slide, please. So Rhodes the philanthropist and the colonialist was not the only statue that was under dispute. There was Jan Smuts, uh, Queen Victoria, General Buerta, uh, Van Riebeck, Gandhi, and significantly Tosius. A theorist who argued that the Bible proved the inferior inferiority of black people and the right of whites to rule over them. So one might ask, what has a biblical theorist of the divine right of whites got to do with Rhodes, the child of colonial liberalism? What might be the link between them? Is it possible that liberalism's vision of modernity and progress slides too easily into the right to rule over others, made easier by invoking divine authority and further enabling super exploitation of land and labor? But the story goes beyond mere physical oppression and exploitation. Next slide, please. Slide. Ah. So on the 9th of March, 2015, uh, Kumani Makrele uh, flings feces on, on, on the road statue. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. And then a month later, uh, the statue is removed. Um, and so what does all this mean? How does this come about? Uh, if, the next slide, please. Stuart Hall has described heritage when referring to Britain as the material embodiment of the spirit of the nation. He meant that the state-driven notions of heritage rely on a harmonious conception of the nation or empire through selected built environment, texts, media, and performances. In official language, heritage is hardly ever seen as disputatious. In South Africa, after the Act of Union in 1910, which excluded the black majority there was an untroubled understanding of heritage as derived implicitly from Eurocentric notions of the right to rule over others, the natives in this case, who without history had to be discovered in their primitiveness and to bring them into the modern era, whether by slow liberal reforms or through the harshness of apartheid. Servants at best, slaves at worst. The idea was to bring the black majority their wisdom, what was good for them, including progress and secularism, in part derived from Christian ethics. The idea, when challenged by the underclasses, became the fulcrum around acrimonious debates and actions to assert the right to be recognized, heard, treated with justice, accept, accept their knowledges, and that races and Eurocentric versions are not automatically the norm. Next slide, please. In this slide, I show that the issues that directly affected the University of Cape Town are a microcosm of the wider society. As the then SRC president, Rabina Mahapa remarked, discrimination, prejudice, and racism is a condition of all forms of oppression and alienation. The alienation of black people is directly related to power that is erased their history, their cultures, their knowledge, and their dignity, and in a word, their heritage. To point to one example, a migrant, a worker, or a slave suffers an injustice when as a result of, of asymmetrical power and identity prejudice, their social experiences are marginalized by defining in particular ways by a dominant group, such as a biblical justification of their subservient status and position. Similarly, an injustice is suffered when a Rhodes must fall student tries to explain to a university manager or a white student why the removal of the statue is necessary. And the hero dismisses the argument on the grounds that it happened in the past, or Rose was a philanthropist, and she should be grateful. It is irrational. By doing this, you're denying the impulse for recognizing knowledge based on experience of master-servant relationships and the collective sense of oppression embodied in the Rhodes statue and the justicable necessity of a break with the past. 
privileges and Eurocentric assumptions are reinforced on an everyday level on the campus from the food provided to the required readings and reinforce Eurocentric assumptions about knowledge, about scientific acumen, about skills and ability and interpersonal interactions based on status, on occupation and above all on race, class and gender. In the aftermath of the Rhodes Must Fall movement, these issues were being addressed, but it is still very difficult. And there's a continuous debate, sometimes extremely heated and acrimonious. Sometimes one wins and sometimes not. The next slide, please. Legacies of contested heritage can only be resolved if firstly, recognize and acknowledge the indelible way coloniality has imprinted itself as normal culture. We should not treat the statue of Nelson Mandela or Bishop Tutu or Gandhi in the same way as the statue of Rhodes, as if such innocuous and inherited pantheon of famous or infamous people are equal parts of a process of reconciliation and multiculturalism. As one of the black academics said, we need to be careful of multiculturalism as a liberal conceit when the issues of injustices, economic inequalities, stolen land, and denial of the traumatic historical experiences are not considered. Disrupting the normalcy of roads must be considered as a revolt against coloniality of the present. The second issue is how to change this colonial imprint without being specific to the uh, contextual concerns of each situation situation and, and institution, difficult post-colonial conversations about colonialism's culture in sustained non-dominating ways requires a reorientation of the legitimacy and authority of who speaks with what knowledge on the issues that are pertinent. In this sense, the very presence of the road statue, however generous to its historical context, may be an act of continuing epistemic violence. In other words, some statues just have to be removed in order to start a difficult dialogue. Thank you. Um, monuments uh, such as statues uh, move us and they are moved, they are erected and they are taken down. And the reason why the movement of monuments uh, is, is contentious is because they move us also emotionally. Um, if we think about this contentious statue of uh, Robert E. Lee, for example, in Richmond, Virginia, you can see this, kind of, this classic um, equestrian monument with the horse's head bowed, uh, prancing proudly, and with the chest out prideful pose embodiment of pride in Robert E. Lee. Next slide, please. And of course, there's been quite a lot of attention in the United States in the media on the removal of statues of Confederate heroes like the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, um, Robert E. Lee, of course, and uh, everyday soldiers and what have you. And partly why these, the removal of these statues have been contentious is um, what they represent to us emotionally. Uh, you can see here in the bottom left um, of John Calhoun, another classic, uh, what we call in psychology, pride pose, uh, uh, legs spread apart, chest expanded and full of air, direct gaze. And of course, the statue is designed to move us emotionally if we identify with the figure in the bottom left then of course his pride becomes our pride. His expanded chest full of air is meant to fill our chests full of air. And of course, if we do not identify with him, if we actually uh, see him as standing above us or, as, or if we see ourselves as standing underfoot, then of course this becomes not just as a, a pose of pride, but one of dominance and oppression. Next slide. Uh, I just want to give you some uh, some actual uh, data here that's been collected by the Southern Poverty Law Center about the uh, erection of slide uh, of monuments, um, a Confederate monument specifically, over the last 153 years, and about the removal of them. 
Um, so I hope you can see this in more detail, but if not, you can uh, get to the link and see this yourselves. So this is a timeline um, of the erection of Confederate um, monuments in the United States. And you can see there are two major periods where, where um, uh, monuments were erected. Uh, and this first one on the left is post-reconstruction and uh, during the Jim Crow era, which is when most of these monuments were erected. And then you can see another blip there that's more green and red in the middle to the right, um, which is during the Civil Rights era. And next, please. Uh, the empty circles are the uh, Confederate monuments that have actually been uh, removed. Uh, 146 since the, um, the massacre at the Charleston um, Church. Um, and in fact, a vast majority of those have been removed even more recently um, this past summer in the United States. 93 of those actually happened after George Floyd's killing um, by the police on May 25th in Minneapolis. Um, so this is important because the removal of the statues I showed you in the previous slide have got, gained a lot of attention and have led to a lot of controversy. But it's very important to note that, in fact, very few monuments have actually been removed. Uh, this should be next, please. There should be another animation there. Yes. So the Southern Poverty Law Center estimates that even though 146 monuments have been removed since 2015, that leaves nearly 1,800 uh, symbols, school names, parks, uh, statues on public land um, that memorialize and in most cases glorify the Confederacy. So despite the attention and the heat of the debate, in fact, very little has actually happened and very few monuments have been removed. Next, please. Um, part of this heat, of course, of the debate um, uh, can, can be understood in terms of um, the current president's usage of the pretty infrequent removal of, of monuments like those of the Confederacy, standing in a speech on the July 4th speech, Independence Day speech, standing in front of another monument that produces opposing reactions, depending on whether you identify with um, the figures in the wall, in, in the stone, or if you identify with the stone in the land and its previous meaning to indigenous people. So Trump said at this, uh, at, at, on July 3rd this year, in front of, the, uh, of this memorial, there's a growing danger that threatens every blessing that our ancestors fought so hard for. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history defame our heroes, erase our values, and indoctrinate our children. Angry mobs are trying to tear down statues of our founders, deface our most sacred memorials, and unleash a wave of violent crime in our cities. So if we put the, the hyperbolic nature of this speech aside, we can see here a crystallization of the kind of movement in people, how they are moved by these symbols, especially when they identify them as representing a glorious past. And then of course, the people who challenge the place of those monuments and memorials, or even attack them, deface them, or try to tear them down, become an angry mob that are not just violating or, or uh, history, but are actually presenting an affront to the very core of the nation's identity. Next slide, please. And so if we think about this statue, another example of Robert E. Lee now in um, Charlottesville, Virginia. Again, we see this classic equestrian pose and we see not just the statue, a statue erected some time ago, but we see also Robert E. Lee in an erect, ex expressive, expanded uh, position. Even the horse looks like uh, they're prancing proudly. And of course, when the statue, when there was discussion of removing the statue and renaming the park that was named after Robert E. Lee to Emancipation Park, this brought the response of the now infamous Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August, where clear uh, Nazi, neo-Nazi um, and, and populist uh, right-wing uh, neo-racist movements um, uh, made their voices heard to defend, of course, not just the statue of Robert E. Lee, but what the statue of Robert E. Lee represented for them and for their identities. It's important to note, however, that as, as infrequent as these removals are and as strong as this response might be, there's also a, a counter response on the other side. Next slide, please. So soon after this, in fact, the University of Virginia um, erected this monument, which had been in the works for, for many, many years. This is the memorial to enslaved laborers who helped build the campus and maintain it, the 4,000 or so slaves 
um, that built the campus and maintained it. And we can see a very different kind of memorial here, rather than a memorial that hails us or calls us to look up at it and to take pride in it or to feel trampled under its feet. We have a common style of memorial here that moves us in a very different way. Instead of looking up at it, we're invited to enter into it. And these styles of memorials also, instead of highlighting the heroic figure on the horse, in fact, try to communicate something about scale and scope. So in fact, those nearly 4,000 men, women, and children who were slaves on the, and helped build and maintain the campus, their names are engraved on these slabs. And we can see this in many memorials. You can think of the Vietnam Memorial as another example of this. So a really a, a, a contrasting, not just narrative, but way of trying to move people to think about the same history in the same place in a very different way. Next slide, please. Um, we can also think about another example of the, of, of the contention around uh, monuments. So it's also important that even if you look back to that Southern, Liberty, Southern Poverty Law Center slide, of course, most of the monuments to the Confederacy are in the South. Um, but this, the, this discussion in the United States is not exclusively uh, in the South. And of course, uh, as was mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of debate and discussion and finally removal of the statue of Theodore Roosevelt, which Smithsonian Magazine labeled racist. Um, and you can see another question posed here. This time he's flanked by an African and native uh, uh, gun holders and scouts. Uh, next, please. And the museum has taken a really interesting strategy here of um, creating an exhibit to address the removal of the statue, to talk about the original designer's intents and to bring various voices into the conversation about the meaning of the statue for various people who differentially identify with the figures in the statue. And this was part of a broader political process um, started some years ago by uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York, the Mail Advisory Commission on City Arts Monuments and Markers. Um, that, was a, that was a committee of various people um, who had a discussion about how to deal with monuments like Theodore Roosevelt or Christopher Columbus. And this provides us an interesting example of the way that uh, contentious monuments can be discussed openly and civilly and various sides of the discussion and its an impact on people. The way that it moves people differently um, can be addressed. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and Marie-Louise? Yes, thank you so much, Jacques and Andrew, for the opportunity to speak to you all about contested monuments in a global perspective. I'm especially pleased to be able to speak to you, um, to be on this panel, because that subject speaks specifically to our Contested Histories project that we've been developing over the last three years, looking at global contestations around the world. Um, at this stage, we have, um, may I have the next slide, please? We have surveyed more than 200 cases of disputes in the continents, in five continents, and we are far from finished. The idea behind our study is to provide decision makers, educators, civil society groups, and others who are dealing with similar controversies, information on comparable cases, as well as guidelines and remedies that are task force distilled from a number of case studies. So this is a digital tool. Um, excuse me, back up one. Sorry, Andrew. I have the previous slide, yeah. So this is a digital tool that our team has been um, developing and it plots the different contestations this is an internal tool at this point. We are um, grouping them according to different types of legacies, uh, fascism, communism, slavery, colonialism, et cetera. And many of these, of course, overlap. So they fall into one, more than one uh, category. If you click on, for instance, the colonialism, you'll get all of the ones that we have in our catalog. So that deal with colonialism, whether it's in the United States, in Africa, in, in Europe, uh, Latin America, and elsewhere. At this point, we're testing new GIS software that will allow greater flexibility and allow us to actually bring this tool to a broader public. Uh, we're not at that stage yet. On this map, each pin come, uh, connects to a case with an image and a three to 4,000 word case study with further links for further reading and resources. Um, these cases range from disputes, for example, over statues over comfort women in Asia and Korea, the Philippines, to controversies over statues of Gandhi, which was mentioned before in Africa, to conquistador monuments in Latin America, and the list goes on. 
So as you can see, there's quite a cluster in, in North America and in Europe. As Colin discussed in the US, there are many that deal with the Confederacy, uh, but also others as well, as he mentioned, um, for instance, the Teddy Roosevelt statue. And there's the question of what to do, for instance, with Christopher Columbus in New York. And I'm very pleased actually that on uh, with this webinar, we also have Harriet Senny uh, as a respondent because she was a member of that mayoral commission and can really um, give us more insight into the dis deliberations and discussions that happened there. Um, so in Europe, there's a dense cluster, and these are not only dealing with colonialism. You have disputes in Europe over monuments and statues, uh, street names that deal with things like um, complex history related to fascism, to communism, and other legacies dealing with egregious human rights violations. Um, what is clear, really, is that each and every one of these cases is unique. They all have their uh, specific social, political, cultural, and economic factors. Um, they're all very emotional, as Colin mentioned before, and they and each one has a um, you know specific um, dynamic. However, that uh, through our research and through our co comparisons, we do have we have found that there are some commonalities. First, as Shahid described. The statue itself is rarely the problem, right? I mean, it's always more about the injustice, about uh, oppression, about discrimination, about people feeling marginalized. There's always a reason beyond it. It's not simply because the statue is there. It represents something much deeper within the society. And when you contextualize or relocate or even destroy a statue, it doesn't necessarily mean that the problem is going to go away. Actually, it probably won't. So um, if I have the next slide, please. Um, I'm sure you've all watched the videos of the Colston statue being dragged into the harbor in Bristol. Bristol is a port city with 90 different ethnic groups living there. They self-identify by race, by religion, by ethnicity, by national and cultural heritage. Um, within that city, Colston was omnipresent, not only by the statue prominently placed on Colston Avenue, but his name was on the Colston Music Hall, the Colston Primary School, the Colston Girls School, and the list goes on and on. With Colston's slave trading history, the statue was the target, but the true issue in Bristol is the systemic racism that continues to divide the community today. Uh, our research shows that decision makers must address root causes. They should approach decision making in a participatory, inclusive process, take a multi perspective approach, include those who, most are, who are most affected, do it with them and not for them. Otherwise, more resentment and anger will follow. Another commonality is that in almost all cases, there are legal factors that need to be taken into account. Heritage protection laws in the United States, especially on Confederate statues, and South Africa according with the Cecil Rhodes statue, as Shahid, Shahid knows, um, must be taken into account. In Eastern Europe, we have, uh, and in other countries, we also have so-called memory laws, memory laws that dictate which statues may remain, which names have to be removed, et cetera. Local ordinance have an impact, but even international conventions, international conventions such as the UNESCO World Heritage Convention, where, for instance, we have a case in, in uh, Senegal where there's a statue of the former colonial governor Louis Fideb that the community would like moved. However, it sits on a UNESCO World Heritage Site and therefore can't be moved at this point. Um, another commonality is that there are truly only a limited number of remedies. And I'd like to just run through these very quickly with you. Um, so there is the status quo. I think we, we heard before that sometimes, you know, the status quo is kept because things have to be moved and we, we're not sure yet what can happen to it. Um, the status quo may sometimes also promote more, more conflict. We have this case, for instance, um, at the University of Oxford, where the Rhodes statue, which was protested right after the UCT one, um, students called for it to be removed. And yet the Oriel College at the University of Oxford didn't actually take much action. However, now in the wake of the, the protest movements over Black Lives Matter, they are taking action. It's four years later and they finally decided that it's time to, for a commission to, to meet and to try to come up with some decisions on next steps. So that's a, a status quo. The contextualization, next slide please. Um, we see this, for instance, with street names in Bordeaux and Nantes. These two slave trade, these are former slave trading ports uh, where many ships from France left for the transatlantic uh, 
um, for the triangular slave trade. And these cities have been grappling with what to do with these street names. These na streets were named for benefactors who um, earned, their, earned their money and their wealth on the slave trade, and yet also brought you know, riches to the city. These names are still there. Um, and so both of these cities, Nantes and Bordeaux, have wrestled with that problem. And their, their decision has been to contextualize. So that means they add placards with names of the, the streets and the people and uh, tell also about the history. So it allows the history to be known with all its complexities. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so another um, option that decision makers have is to Resignify and resignifying a monument or a structure can be done uh, in various ways. One is by renaming it. Um, this is the Latin Bridge in Sarajevo. It used to be named the Princip Bridge after the man who killed Archduke Ferdinand in 1914. Um, to the Bosniaks, Princip is an assassin. To Serbian nationalists, he's a hero of Serbian liberation. So this um, name of this bridge has caused quite, an, um, quite a lot of ethnic division within the community. To resolve this, the authorities changed the name to its pre-1945 name, the Latin Bridge, and added a plaque with unbiased text, text very neutral text. Um, but the case also raises a question about principal legacies. Princip, is he a hero or is he an assassin? And how do, other, how do we view others? Columbus, I mean, we, we talked before, explorer or genocidist, or Churchill, was he a World War II hero or a colonialist and racist? And Lee, military leader or upholder of slavery. So what is the person's pr principal legacy or legacies and how does one parse this? These are questions that decision makers have to face. Another option that um, is available is repurposing. And we, um, Senap talked before about repurposing uh, a statue or a monument rather in Algeria and by creating, by enco encompassing it, it becomes a, a work of art. We see the same thing in Paraguay. Here was a statue of the famous dictator Stroessner, the longest serving dictator in Latin America. And uh, at the end of his rule, Almost all the statues were removed, except for this one, which was then repurposed in a way that he is uh, crushed, but his face is still there. His, still face, his face is still recognizable. And instead of um, destroying the history, it's a reminder of the dark history in a society that is still there. Uh, we have another example of repurposing, which in Ukraine, uh, again, laws dictate that all Lenin statues must be destroyed, must be removed. However, they kept this one, and instead of uh, leaving him stand as it, they, they gave him a helmet and turned him into Darth Vader, which of course is a, a ridiculed um, monument at the moment, uh, but also speaks to the legacy of Lenin and the eyes of Ukrainians. Another option, and one that we like very much, is um, a counter monument. So the statue of James Cook in Melbourne, Australia. This year, this uh, in 2020, it's the 250th celebration of our anniversary of the landing of Cook in Batni Bay. And in 2018, the organizers were still talking about possibly uh, erecting a new statue in Batni Bay of Cook. Uh, but of course, he's been, <laughs> he's been vandalized repeatedly in different parts of Australia and, and New Zealand. And so the idea was, well, perhaps we, that's not such a great idea. We should come up with something more innovative. And so they have. They have now installed a new installation. Uh, as you see in the center of this slide, there is an obelisk. That obelisk is dedicated to James Cook. But across from it are what look like ribs of a ship. And this is an installation that was just uh, in 2020 uh, installed here. It's, um, it is a uh, a monument or rather an installation that was prepared by um, several artists um, that wanted to bring the Aboriginal viewpoint. And what they wrote is the ribs of the ship emphasize the ghostly presence of Cook and his men, a metonymy for all facets of colonialism, regardless of whether the viewer perceives it as good or bad. So here you have a counter monument to that. And an article here uh, in the local paper about the installation of this, um, of this a mon monument, I guess we'll call it, that shows the, the ribs very, very clearly along the, the seacoast. So um, I think it's really quite effective. And these counter monuments um, or additive artistic interventions 
can maintain the actual history of the place, but present the different viewpoints, the different perspectives. And that I think is one of the options that um, decision makers really should be looking at. It's how do you present different viewpoints in a way that really dignifies the people who have those viewpoints. So um, that's the counter monuments. And then of course is relocation. And relocation is often taken when uh, in the heat of the moment or because um, the statue has been standing in a very prominent place and shouldn't be there any longer. It's been decided that it should be relocated, but where to? And uh, to relocate them perhaps to some place that is less prominent, but other options in other societies, here we have Taiwan, is to relocate this is Chiang Kai-shek, 200 of his statues are located in the Chihu Memorial Sculpture Park. Um, and that's an option. So parks are also a, a way of uh, collecting these different types of monuments and putting them together and to, in, order, in order to have the history still there, but to present it from a different viewpoint. So you have relocation here. We also have this in um, Memento Park in Hungary. Here you might see what's happened to uh, Stalin, all that remains are his boots. And I think that's sending quite a message because he's quite the empty person now, but his, his boots remind us of the fact that he had quite a strong presence in Hungary uh, and well in other countries as well, but for Hungarians specifically. And then we have removal and, and Shahid's already spoken about it so eloquently. I just want to say that um, removal is sometimes um, one of the most practical um, solutions and um, to put, for instance, the, the statue into uh, into storage until further decisions can be made. And Shahid, I don't know if there's been a decision, but last I heard, um, Rose is still in uh, in storage somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And so is uh, Colston in in Bristol. Although I understand that in he will be that Colston will be moved into the local museum along with the protest signs and possibly also the counter monument that was put up for for that uh, and. Yeah, so we look forward to seeing that in Bristol as well. And finally, I just want to say that another um, yeah, challenge that decision makers have is what to do when there is a statue that's vandalized. And here's a, a, one of my favorite examples is the Empress Josephine. She was Napoleon's first wife. She was born in Martinique. She was born to a very wealthy slave owning family in Martinique. Uh, and in 1794, um, slavery was abolished in the French colonies. However, in 1802, apparently, and it's alleged, it hasn't been confirmed, she convinced Napoleon that he should be, uh, rein that he should reinstate slavery, and he did in 1802. It remained legal uh, in the French colonies for another almost half century. In the 1990s, the statue of Josephine was decapitated and um, splattered with red paint. And that's how she stood up until July of this year, and she's now been destroyed. But the vandalized statue, I thought the decision makers there did a very good job of, of maintaining that because in this essence, she, she tells a story. She tells a story, yes, that France um, brought slaves here to Martinique. They enslaved people in Martinique. And um, France was responsible for this terrible, egregious crime. And should it shouldn't be forgotten. And so, um, and so she stands. Now the question with this is, will she be, there is word that she will be, um, restored, but will she be restored to uh, having her head or headless? And I'm very much hoping that she'll stay headless if they do restore her. Um, in closing, I just want to reiterate that protests and disputes over monuments and statues are truly a global phenomenon. Each is different, but they are happening everywhere in the world, even in places such as Greenland, and Switzerland, which we've just added to our catalog this week. So the real challenge facing decision makers is how to deal with these controversies in ways that promote inclusivity rather than divisiveness in societies. Uh, we do have a forthcoming book coming out on principles, processes, and best practices. It's being published by the International Bar Association. There are 10 in-depth case studies, and I'm very happy that Shahid helped us with that book. Um, it will be available online um, very soon. And I would just like to say that if you'd like more information about the book, or about our project, or specific cases, please feel free to write to me or con look check our website. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, um, everyone. Uh, this was really amazing in a very short period of time. There are lots and lots of rich uh, avenues to explore. Uh, what I'm going to do is to ask Harriet Senny and Ravina 
just to comment on what we've heard and things that come up for you. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna to have to ask both of you to be really brief so that we can all come together and then have a fuller discussion with all of us. So Harriet Senny, who, as you just heard, was actually on the mayoral commission, but she also has worked on public art, public art memorials, memory and material culture. And she's a professor of art history at City College in New York. And she's also been uh, a visiting distinguished professor at Carnegie Mellon and elsewhere. So Harriet, quick, brief observation from your side, since you have really devoted your life to this. So thank you very much. And then thank Ravina, you. I'm going to introduce Ravina and then Ravina, you can also comment right after. And Ravina is the uh, director of the Columbia Global Centers in Mumbai. And she's a, a sociocultural anthropologist with a degree in that field was a tenured professor at Smith and then has been uh, with us as a colleague at the Columbia Center. So, and she's worked in the cultural spaces and the public monument spaces in multiple ways. So Harriet first. Okay, thank you for being able to participate. I will be very quick. Um, one thing I wanted to discuss because it's come up in this conference and elsewhere is I think we need to think about the reason that whether the reason the monuments are being challenged or toppled is the same reason as they were erected. And if that is the case, as it clearly is with Confederate monuments, then I think it's not that complicated. But monuments to George Washington are not, right? Those were erected for different reasons. And that prompts a more nuanced conversation I think it's very important in the present moment that we don't discount history. We need to know why it was commissioned and what it meant then. That's part of the contextualization process. And I wanna emphasize that it's not an either or issue. It's not, was he a good guy or was he a bad guy? He was both. It's an and issue and it's how we get that and into a single, in this case, visual narrative, that's the real challenge. I wanna also raise a couple of issues from an art historical point of view, cause that's what I am, an art historian. I wanna ask the question, is toppling or marking an existing work of art with graffiti or whatever, is that vandalism? Because for example, we would consider editing a published work, no matter how heinous, in a comparable way, we would consider that censorship. Another art historical perspective. These works are considered only in terms of their subjects. Sometimes the artist isn't even named. So what's art got to do with it? Should it matter if a work of art in question is of aesthetic value or historical value? That's usually left out. I want to reiterate what some have said, Marie Louise, more recently, the importance of temporary non-invasive interventions, projections, performances, all those things add and prompt a different conversation. And of course, these controversies are by nature political and they prompt a reactive response. And I'm really happy to note that there are so many more proactive approaches being taken, such as the one Marie Louise just described to us, um, the Mellon Grant, which just funded Monument Lab to create a national audit. And there is a New York City task force, which is going to undertake this locally, but we haven't met yet. So stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, Ravina? Yeah. And we'll thank you, everyone. And thank you, Shaka and Andrew, for this amazing uh, panel. Um, I'm just going to um, actually ask a couple of questions that were uh, suggested by the talks today. And we know that, um, you know, if we look at what's happening in this moment with what Vishaka identified as, um, you know, destruction, you know, as a major uh, thematic that's emerging in how people are reacting to uh, memorials, whether they are statues and, um, you know, other speakers talked about uh, street names, um, uh, collections, we, we've seen that in collections, we've seen that in various ways in which the state and official history celebrates what it considers history. And then what's happening now is a questioning of, of 
either cultural imperial histories or other histories in this destructive way. What well, we're also seeing at this moment, a big rise in right-wing movements, right? So if we move, if we look at cultural imperialism or if we look at imperialism, then at how do we differentiate in the process of destruction of these histories, uh, of these symbols that are historical? Um, how do we distinguish between the kind of um, destruction that Vishaka, you brought up of um, monuments like Babri Masjid and, um, and the, the Bamiyan Buddhas, that kind of destruction and the destruction that we see that's coming out of, you know, the, the strong emotion and the, and, the, and the experiences that people have felt with the colonial enterprise. So at what point do, do these agendas then um, have to be more nuanced and how can we think about that without merging into one another? How can the right then be not, um, you know, um, how, can, how can protest movements not then take on the, the language or that is used by, um, you know, oppressive um, state as well? So that's one. Um, I really enjoyed the, the taxonomy uh, of alternative uh, actions that uh, Marie Louise presented. And I also want to add to that and think about, you know, not only counter monuments, but also erecting and claiming public spaces that a lot of communities have done, whether it's through, um, you know, museums that celebrate their own legacies. Um, and they're not necessarily counter to anything. It's a celebration of who they are. And I'm thinking of the Indian context where we saw um, this happen, you know, until 2012, where we had, um, you know, a, a, a state government that was headed by Mayawati, who was a Dalit leader. And she went through a massive drive to commemorate building stat statues that were honoring um, you know, a Dalit legacy through friezes, statues, public monuments. And she wanted to make visible Dalit contributions and also to establish herself as a political heir to a Dalit legacy, as is argued by the scholar Melia Belli. Um, so when we talk about this new rise of infrastructure that we are seeing through, through statues that are being commissioned, all over, whether it's um, by people who felt invisible and marginalized or by the state to celebrate, you know, bigger, um, their own legacies and political parties to celebrate their own legacies. Can we also talk about it, the issue of built infrastructure? So when we think about the environment and we think about material culture, uh, which, in, you know, we are, we're, we're talking about commissioning new kinds of works which can't be erased and affects all communities very seriously. So in between this destruction that Vishaka spoke about and construction is the space of preservation and maintenance. And I wanted to cite a quick um, example from my own research in Ladakh and Tibet. There are, uh, you know, chortens or stupas among the Buddhist communities who live there that are commemorative shrines to kin members, events, or spiritual or political leaders. And if a community does not maintain it, they fall into disuse and dis disrepair, and the landscape is littered with, you know, falling stupas and new ones which have been whitewashed and spruced up. So, can we think of a new kind of aesthetic then uh, that uses more environmental friendly materials um, to correct, uh, to, to commemorate. And then can we see maintenance and repair rather than uh, destruction or construction as a way for um, us look, bringing history into present significance? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, we have so many different um, areas, but it seems to me as I was listening to all of you, the one question that Ravina pointed out is very much on my mind, and that is that how do we think about destruction of things that come from other kind of political ideology? Babri Masjid comes to mind, and yet one could see it as all as destruction. So most of you, our speakers, have really essentially addressed the issues of power, power in the intent. So it's either colonial, confederation, uh, Jim Crow era, or even Teddy Roosevelt, that it has something to do with the power base. It's primarily Euro-American, let's face it, right? So that's the issue. Then there is the issues of internal political struggles and different kinds of power. And then there is also the 
uh, in the name of religion that actually there are other political considerations why things are, are, are um, destroyed or not. And in between that space is possibility of how do we look at these? Because monuments, things are in a way, they embody so many other contexts as many of you pointed out. So the question I want to ask um, all of you, both panelists and our uh, discussants is that how do we think about this? And Mary Louise, I want to ask you, <coughs> You've, you've classified them, but our responses to these things are very different. So when Palmyra was destroyed, we all were aghast because it's a World Heritage Monument and yet destruction occurred. Is it because we have classified things as World Heritage in a certain way and it wears the artistic aesthetic importance? If it's not aesthetically important, is it different? How do we think about this? So there's a Harriet question and that there is a Ravina question. And I wonder if any one of you on the panel would like to think about it. And I, I would go to you, Shahid, because you often thought about the modernity, colonial, and those questions. <laughs> okay, so there were a couple of questions in, 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 the, in, the, in the chat session that I just want to uh, address. Um, and uh, firstly, uh, the road statue is in storage. It's not being destroyed. So there was a question around whether it was destroyed. It hasn't been destroyed. In fact, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, between the time um, uh, Kumani Makrela uh, throws the feces on the statue and its final removal, it goes through several of what um, Marie Louise had described several ways in which the statue was 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 reconstituted. Um, one was that it was it was uh, a site of discussion, uh, a, a very intense discussions that took place at the statue itself. Uh, another one was uh, where it was it was covered in black bags. Uh, very symbolically and very deliberately. Uh, and there were other movements as, uh, associated with it. Uh, and towards, uh, well, after it was removed, there was uh, another protest movement that took its place, which was called Shackful. Uh, and that was to bring <coughs> attention to uh, really the housing question, both of students and, and of, the, of, of, of the majority of people. So uh, again, it comes back to this, to this point that it wasn't just about the statue for something of more than that. Uh, what was very clear about the, whereas at Rhodes University, it was, Rhodes was a colonialist and he was a bad guy. Uh, it was a very straightforward one. But at, at the University of Cape Town, it was much more layered, much more complex. And it was about around what I mentioned, one of the key demands was that the University of Cape Town was like any other university you would find in Europe or the United States. It taught that kind of syllabus, but not, not reflective of what uh, you might call the continent itself. It was not reflective of black intellectuals. Uh, if, you had, if you had looked at a reading list of uh, sociology 10 years ago at UCT, it wouldn't have been any different from any other university in Europe or, or the United States or Canada or Australia for that matter. And so there was the, what was, what was very important was, was what I talked about as coloniality in the present. In other words, the continuation of certain modes of thinking and doing uh, that perpetuates the colonial presence. Even if <clears throat> the colonists are not there physically, even though Rhodes is not there, we still feel the presence of colonialism in the city of Cape Town. And that's the point that has been uh, that the students were addressing, that uh, many of the intellectuals on the university campus were addressing. And that had to change. 
And there's been remarkable changes that have taken place, but clearly not enough of that. And I think that's, that's quite important. Uh, there was a question around, um, um, yeah. Uh, what, I, I talked about one of these, the, 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 the statues that, that drew some attention. This was at another university, at Northwest University. And it was a statue of the, the person that uh, claimed through uh, what may be uh, somewhat disingenuous ways of quoting from the Bible to argue that, that blacks were inferior and therefore have to be ruled by white people. Uh, and that's where the religion comes in. Right. But we have to understand why is that religion being used? Is it a, is it a substitute for arguing about and other, allowing for other kinds of powers to continue? And that's precisely what happened. So um, I'm not yeah. sure if there were other issues that I needed to address. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I think that any one of you might answer this, but it does seem to me that, and actually uh, there is a comment uh, by one of the attendees, uh, Jim, I think it is, who said, Jim Dingerman, that said, you know, but what is the bottom line that, and it does striking down monuments represent slavery, colonialism in this present moment, lead to socioeconomic equality, redistribution of resources, or is it just a temporarily feel good moment? So anything around power structure within a Euro-American context, that's one set of questions. Then I do think that we have mm -hmm. to look at the questions that are internalized. So that let's say in Tunisia or in Algiers or in India, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there are other issues, are they also about power? In what way? And what is the reason there? So do we make a distinction between these so that the power structures within and without, we seem to have an easier time sometimes to condone the internal issues that are going on, but mm. not, you know, in other words, is that also part of the neoliberal attitude that we bring to the table? in terms of how we look at something and how do we reflect on that? So another person has said that, is it about if heritage must be rooted in universal values? Because Confederate statues clearly are not in universal values because it's about a particular intent. But we think of Bamiyan mm -hmm. Buddhas as universal values. Now, mm -hmm. it's worth remembering as an art historian, I would say that Bamiyan Buddhas were also political statements at the time when they were made by the royalty that created it on a trade route to establish their power. So that too had specific mm -hmm. contests. So one of the things that I think that's really uh, challenging and interesting and complex is that visual images have capacity to be the product of a particular time and place and intent but also a capacity to transcend that time and place. And sometimes they transcend, sometimes they don't. And then what is that specificity that comes back to haunt you? And what is the universality that goes above it? Mm. And how do we deal with it? So it's not even just the aesthetic quality, but the visual images in general that we need to constantly ask ourselves, why is it so powerful? Why is that so simple? Uh, kind of get to us in a different way. As Colin was saying that there is the emotion involved in the making of it and the reception of it. And when the intent and receptions get out of whack, then it creates much, much bigger problem. So um, any comments, there's a number of things. It's about, is this just a feel good moment? Is it temporary? Is it just nothing is changed because destructions, preservation issues have been with us forever? Um, Harriet, yeah. Yes, two points. Um, one is, it, yes, tearing something down is a symbolic action, but a process that addresses it can also include something more specific. So for example, on the mayoral commission, when we voted to have the Dr. Sims statue removed, we also included that the New York Academy of Medicine across the street host a program on women's health. It's a start. That kind of thing, I think, should always be linked. The second point, which is, again, from an art historical perspective, 
I'm concerned about visual illiteracy. In that sense, I mean, a lot of people look at these works and to them it looks like indicates that that's their meaning, but looks like is not necessarily either what they were intended to mean or what they mean if you look at them closely. A very brief example, um, the African figure in the statue in front of, uh, the, which had been in front of the Museum of Natural History was interpreted by many as a black uh, from New York. So that's clearly an example of not looking not looking that they were carrying guns, et cetera. There was, there's a lot of not seeing in our responses that prompt moods that may not exactly coincide with what we're looking at. Thank you. I mean, I think one of the things is we all have to constantly reflect on where we come from too. Absolutely. In, so what are the attitudes that we bring to the table? And just to elaborate that our goal here is to explore it's not so much opinions as much as explore how we might think about these issues. And some of it is gonna come from particular prejudices that we have to also examine. Um, any can I, other- Can I say something about the moment, yeah. the feel good moment? Colleague. Exactly, yeah. 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 So I, I think, um, I mean, <clears throat> whether that's the political effect or not, or psychological effect is one question, but I think it is important to recognize that the structure of our physical space and especially our public space is not just a symbolic value. We inhabit that space as feeling beings. And so um, feel good moments. It's not just about the, uh, the removal of a statue or the more memorialization of a fuller history. Those are things that we experience and feel in a very real level as we inhabit public space and are central not to us psychologically, but of course to our uh, civic culture. So, yes, I understand the worry about looking for a feel-good moment, but I think when we're talking about public space and about physical space, this is an important impact on us as we walk through it together. And so it does go beyond a feeling good or bad in the moment. Right. I mean, I think, Colleen, you really bring up a very important point, and that is the publicness of things. And when you're walking around, the impact of perpetuation of something. Or in fact, it is that how do you change that narrative so that people actually can deal with it, right? Both positively and negatively, that's another set of question. So that, and, and at the same time, if it was only just about that, other issues that are embedded in that sculpture, in that making of things, also have to be addressed. But there is something about the symbolic value as well as emotional value. That's what you're talking about, if I understand you correctly. Yeah, no, very important. Yes, Marie-Louise. You are muted, yeah. Unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I was just saying that, you know, it's very clear that societies evolve and what is, you know, how people thought about statues of a Christopher Columbus, excuse me, in 1895 or 1898 is not necessarily how they feel about him today. So as the societies change, so do people's perceptions and people's awareness of what these symbols actually mean for them and for their communities. I think protest is a, is a very healthy thing. And I think that what happens when there's a protest, for instance, in South Africa about roads, people start thinking, well, what about the statue in my community? Or what does this mean to me? And oftentimes we, I I mean, I, you know, I spend a lot of time living in Paris and walk by lots of statues I never even looked at before, really. I mean, I saw them from the corner of my eye. I knew where they stood. But what did they actually mean? And I think a protest movement that starts in, in a place like at UCT and, and, and travels forward, it makes people aware. It makes people aware of their surroundings. It makes people aware of the symbolism and of the signaling and how the different people, how different people do view these things. And, and it does matter. It really does. I also think that um, when you have protests over 
a monument, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt in front of the American Museum of History or elsewhere, it makes you, it, you realize this is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Decision makers should see this as an opportunity for, for them to also think about how to rescript their communities in ways that bring inclusivity, that you might look at these and say, oh gosh, you know, in my community, there are like, you know, there's 25 statues and they're all men and they're all white men. You know, shouldn't we do, be doing something about this? So um, as we see this movement, um, and I do think we're in sort of a monumental movement, if you want to play on that word, um, we can really start rethinking about what our communities should have in them. And um, I love, for instance, there's an example in Tartu, Estonia. You know, there's not a there's not a big statue of an Estonian leader or some, you know, some white businessman or something. There's a statue of two students kissing. You know, I think that's a, it's a university city. It's a university town. It's it's it makes you feel good, it, and it it speaks to the community. It speaks to the people there. So yeah, I think um, protests over statues I think are quite healthy, and I think it's making us all realize that we do live in a world together, and how how these things are impacting our 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 neighbors, our friends, our family. We should be thinking about them, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we remove them right away, but we should be doing something about them for sure. Yeah. Um, Zainab, you have not uh, been um, there. You have been silent. Any comment from your side on this issue of protest, power, intent, reception? I've been thinking about it as the discussions um, were happening. On the one hand, it's extremely useful to have this very broad platform where we discuss about monuments from all over the place. On the other hand, I was thinking that we're losing something by collapsing uh, a lot of specificity into generalities. And that disturbs me, and I see that kind of collapsing in some of the questions that we're receiving. So to me, um, there is a big difference between what happens, say, in the seventh century, then what happened in a particular region of the world, then what happens, uh, uh, let's say, in Africa today. So I think now that we are beginning to understand the complexities, it is probably time to be a little bit more careful about not collapsing, not flattening uh, the reasons for uh, and, and the various actions. I mean, the reason I gave you very specific examples was just because of that. And then again, we could talk about who makes those decisions? I'm uncomfortable with the word decision maker because we're assuming that there is something coming from above, which is exactly what happened in Algeria. Right. Who are the decision makers there and why are we not questioning that? So, um, and I am also feeling a little bit um, shy about making statements or developing conclusions on what's happening today. I am a historian. I like my historical distance and I can understand things better over a historical distance. But right now we should do this, we shouldn't do that. That is a little bit worrisome for me. Well, I mean, I think in a way, Zainab, the reason why you're here is precisely to remind us that historians have a very important value and that is to provide some context in which we might look at the present mm -hmm. and comparative thing has some value because we can ask some questions and that's the reason to bring to flash a kind of focus on where we are currently to be able to say gee have we asked all of the questions how might we actually create some space between us and the action we might take. And that's the main reason I think to actually do this. So it's not so much to flatten the discussion, but it is to raise new questions that we might not have thought about. And that's one of the reasons, and reflection is what we do as academics here to some extent. So I think that's one of the reasons to do this. Um, but I mean, I think I, uh, Jim Denyuman has a big 
question, and that goes back to Colin, uh, you as well. And that is this sort of Jim Crow moment, reconciliation in North and South, and to really not just to unite what was the unification about, but also the martial culture in the American mainstream where Robert E. Lee was put in a particular position. So there are certain values that were identified with those sculptures, especially people like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson that actually were not so much just about slavery as about other things too, but they were part and parcel of it. It's sort of like Harriet, what you were saying about Teddy Roosevelt, that yes, he was a great environmentalist. That was one of the reasons why Museum of Natural was interested in them. But by having those two images, it also causes us to question. So we have to think about the context in which things are made and what are the issues that come together. And so Colin, do you have any thought on this business of the intent of the statues especially some of them, not if not all of them. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Teddy Roosevelt is a good example. And I, I tried to, I didn't go into detail, but I think this is, um, this is, this fits with, I think, what a lot of people were saying that how people, how, a, how people read a statue like that or other statues uh, or monuments today may have very little to do with the original intent of the statue with the intent of the artist or even with the intent of the institution or whoever put it there. And so this is part of the decontextualized nature of a lot of these monuments and, and ambiguity and why they're then, you know, able to be read on this basis of subjective position and interpretation. And so I think, you know, at some level we could think about these contextualization efforts that people have raised as a way to give people more information through which they can read those statues. But of course, part of how we read monuments or statues or, or all historical symbols is of course our own subject position and our own relationship to that history. But certainly um, I think we could be doing a lot more to contextualize and to bring into conversation as the Museum of Natural History has done in New York, um, the artist's intention, the museum's intentions, and the the complicated full life of the people um, being symbolized. But yeah, I think when you see that statue and you see it's true that uh, the intention was to represent the, the African and the native person as gun bearers for Roosevelt. And that's right. But of course, isn't it it's also right to see that these were two people, these were people from two groups that were likely to fill those subordinated roles because of who they were. So both of those things are true. And I think, you know, to be to give people a better chance of having civil discourse and proper understanding, we should be representing these aspects of history in a fuller range. So this can be part of people's emotional and other responses to the monuments. No, I absolutely, because I do think that there is something about grand narratives that actually don't take into account the subtleties. And I was thinking as you were talking, Colin, that brings me back to the Ravina question and that was, how do I deal with Babri Masjid in India? The, this 16th century Muslim monuments that's being destroyed by the Hindu right wing and now they're gonna rebuild the temple because they are creating a grand narrative. So in some ways, it's like the Jim Crow moment, you know, in destruction, which is to say that that was wrong because it was actually putting a Muslim monument in front of the Hindu man, a, a site that was sacred. And therefore there is something about the new grand narrative that's been created by destroying that to do what they perceive as a historical wrong that has to be righted but it is in the context of the narrative of a majoritarian culture. And so it's interesting to, I mean, I had not really quite thought about it that way, but there is something about power dynamics in creation and destruction that are always gonna be there. And how do we unpack it and how do we understand it and what are the contexts? And with that, it's 11.34. I think this has been an amazingly rich conversation. We will, we have recorded it. Some of this will go into the next piece of uh, material and research that we are doing, but I can't thank all of you enough. Our panelists, the discussants, really very, very rich discussion. We've just scratched the surface, but we've at least put some questions on the table and to,
complicate the story that we might tell each other as we go forward. And I also want to thank all the uh, audience attendees. Thank you very much. You've come from many different parts of the world. You have many different opinions and ideas. So we have your chats and that will be also very helpful to us. And thank you, Andrew, for keeping us on, you know, getting all the technical work done right. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.